and welcome to Breast Cancer Now's Instagram Live. It's good to see you all tonight. And we're going to be joined shortly by Liz O'Reardon, who has been with us many, many times before. I'm very, very grateful that she um, has agreed to join us again. And she's going to be answering your questions about um, hormone therapy primarily. We've had loads of questions in, so do bear with us if, um, if we're not answering quite as quickly or succinctly as, as we might, but we will try and keep up with it all. My name's Rachel and I'm one of the nurses at Breast Cancer Now. Um, please do remember that we have a helpline um, and it will be open tomorrow morning or you can leave a message tonight 0808 800 6000 and our nurses will be there to take your calls um, as and when you, you want to call. We're open again on Saturday morning as well. You can also send us an email through our Ask Our Nurse service if you want to ask us as something in particular. Right. I should have Liz with me shortly. Hello everybody, lovely to see you. Lots of you here. Hi Liz. Hi. How's things? You've had such a busy week. It's been crazy, it really has, but just so good to be able to help women and show them how to examine their breasts properly. So yeah. yeah. I can't I can't tell you how um grateful we are. So um I mean from our perspective at Breast Cancer Now, it's just great to be able to say to people this is a really trusted source. Yeah. Um so uh yes, but I know it's uh, on top of your birthday and everything else that's been going I know. on. <laughs> and I think before we start I wanna say it's been quite a difficult couple of weeks. There's been yes, quite a lot of women you. who have died in the last couple of weeks. And I think the secondary mm -hmm. breast cancer community are really, really feeling it. Yeah, and the primary you. community are thinking, oh, my goodness, is this what it's yeah. going to be like for me? And it is so hard to help both groups. And I just hope with the next month coming up, we can get more money into metastatic cancer research to try and cure mm -hmm. this. And you do amazing work, but it's just yeah. I'm feeling for you all. You're in my yeah. heart. So and thank you for joining yeah. in. Yeah. And um, yes, there will be lots of announcements from breast cancer now around research and secondary breast cancer. It's something that we work really hard on and to support women who have secondary breast yeah. cancer and are living with that. And those who are, as you said, who are absolutely, you know, being rocked to their cause with this news over the last few weeks. Um, it's been incredibly difficult. And, our, you know, our thoughts go out to all those families out there and yeah. friends and, and everybody else. So tonight um, we are going to be talking about hormone therapy and um, side effects which you have experienced Liz, many yes. <laughs> and varied. Um, I'm just going to get my list of questions up because um, we have had loads. And I think it's fair to say as a breast cancer surgeon I had no idea how bad the effects mm. would be. Yeah. I just used to say, it's a bit of the menopause, you'll have a, ho a few hot flushes, you'll get over it. And then I was a patient, and I thought, bloody hell. Now I know why a lot of women don't take the tablets and tell me they do. So yeah. I know how you're feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that people have brought up, you know, with these tablets are so awful. Why on earth are you giving them to us? And how do you expect us to continue to take them? And that feeling of not wanting to go and talk to their treatment teams and say, look, this yeah. is really awful. What advice would you, I know that's not one of our questions, but I think it's really important for us to talk a little bit about that. So I think the main treatment of breast cancer is surgery to remove the tumour and remove lymph nodes. And everything else we give you is to prevent it coming back. And the best that we have for those of you who have hormone positive disease are these tablets. And because your breast cancer feeds off oestrogen, we need to lower the levels in your body. Mm -hmm. But what that does is give you a menopause. As I'm sure you all know from your mums, some of you, like mine, were in the supermarket every day in the freezer while just dripping off, whereas others just sail through and everybody's different. It does get better after six months, but some people like me struggle. The best thing you can do is talk to your breast surgeon. Ring your breast care nurse and say, I'm struggling. Because we have algorithms now that can find out exactly what your benefit is. And a lot of women benefit from just having a treatment break. I'd rather you said, look, can I just have a couple of months off to see how bad it is and then go back on it than lying and not really taking them. Yeah. We know what it's like. We want to help you. If you can hang on for the first couple of years, it does get easier. But just talk to us. See if we can help. Is there something else we can do? 
What's been um, one of the most difficult side effects that you've had to cope with? Is there anything that you wanted to share with people? Yeah, I, I think there's two. In the beginning, it was the hot flushes and the night sweats. Mm. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night thinking I'd wet myself because there was water trickling down my bum crease and my thigh. But oh my God, I've wet the bed. And that was a night sweat. And I would have them every hour in the night. And I'd have hot mm. flushes in the day, doing the old <sighs> stripping off. I thought, I'm never going to sleep properly again. And I'm at work and, I'm, and I found that really, really hard to deal with. And there are some tablets that you can have to help because we shouldn't really have HRT. The biggest thing for me, though, was the lack of libido and the effect yeah. on my sex life. As a young woman, I was suddenly in an instant menopause and the dry, tight vagina, the cystitis, I don't want sex. Mm. Watching a hot film doesn't get me wet anymore. I was shocked at and the guilt that I had on me and my marriage. And it's like, go and find mm -hmm. a woman with two breasts and a healthy libido, because I never want it again. And there are things you can do to help. But I never talked to patients about it. I had no idea there were things you could do. And that's why I mean, we've done an Instagram Live about sex, just yeah. to say you can get your penetrative sex life, back, sex life back if you want. Yes, absolutely. And uh, there is lots of information. I mean, you can go onto YouTube or go and find our live, but YouTube's probably the easiest. Looks for Liz's yeah. um, broadcast. And, uh, I get my bag of tricks now. out, don't I? <laughs> you are fantastic. Um, and yeah, your honesty. I mean, this is what we need. We need honesty. Yeah. Um, because I, I, you know, we often hear on the helpline, um, it, I'm really sorry to talk about this. It's been, it seems really trivial after everything that I've been yeah. through. I don't want to talk to my doctors. Please do talk to them. Talk to your breast care nurse. Talk to us at Breast Cancer Now. There are things that can help and uh, will support you. Yeah. Quite a few questions coming through about joint pain. Yes. Um, this is really common. So Theoretically, you shouldn't get a lot of joint pain on tamoxifen. How tamoxifen works is it blocks breast cells taking up estrogen, but it's, you still get estrogen in your bones, so it's bone protective, although the levels in the body are lower. So you may feel a bit of kind of achy, but it's not, it shouldn't be really, really bad. When you have anastrozole or letrozole, you have to have those after your ovaries have stopped, so when you're not having periods. And after that time, you make estrogen in your fat. And the anastrozole and letrozole stop an enzyme making that estrogen. So you have none. So it's not even helping your bones. And that's when a lot of people get pain in their small joints. So their hands, their fingers, their feet. And it can be crippling. Mm. Really, really bad. And I had no idea. And actually, I ended up with carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah. Um, because it just... I was getting pain in my hands. I now sleep in wristbands. I had no idea it could be this bad. And if you're, if you're active, if you play sports, you will find that any injury, like an Achilles tendon tear or plantar fasciitis or tennis elbow, takes a lot longer to heal. Mm. And that's because estrogen is a normal lubricant. So without it, your joints and tendons are more stiff. And it's just accepting this may be me now. Exercise yes. can really help getting the joints. And it's the last thing you want to do when you're tired, but exercise mm. can just get the blood flowing. It can loosen the tendons. It can lubricate everything and it does help. But it's, mm. it's kind of something most women have to live with after the menopause, sadly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and you, I know you do lots and lots of different exercise, but exercise can mean a simple thing like walk, going for a walk, yeah. a brisk walk every day, which is great for your bones, great for your bone health. And getting those quads strength. Exactly. And mm -hmm. it, it comes down to bone health. When you don't have estrogen, your bones start to weaken and thin. And that's why anyone on an AI should have regular DEXA scans every two to three years, because you're at risk of getting osteopenia, which is when the bones start to thin, and osteoporosis, when you're at risk of getting fractures. So yeah. you should all be really taking calcium and vitamin D supplement if you're on an enromatase inhibitor. But weight-bearing exercise, so walking, running, jogging, tennis, whatever it is, and resistance training. You don't need to be in a gym. Squats and lunges on the toilet when the kettle's boiling will improve your bus muscles and improve your bone strength and stop you getting fractures earlier than you should. Yeah. And um, if um, you're, you're worried or you're thinking, I've not had um, a bone scan, bone density scan, uh, DEXA scan, then please do get in touch with your team, your breast care nurse, and just ask them yeah, what's I happening think, with that. I think with COVID, a lot of things have gone out the window. People haven't been had that regular follow up because life has just been crazy. But if you talk to your breast mm. nurse and say, I'm on an AI, should I have had a bone scan? I don't think I've had one. 
they will check with your surgeon and come back to you. And normally it's the GP who arranges it and it's done separately from the breast team. Mm -hmm. But going back to bone pain, bone pain is a sign of recurrence. And we should probably talk yeah. about that now, Rachel. Um, sure. The aches and pains that you get from tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors are different to the pain of bone pain. And there's a great information on breast cancer now, but it's a deep pain. And you'll often feel it in the big joints, so in your shoulders, in your hips, in your back, and it's worse at night. So you're lying down in bed, you're kind of still, and it's, it's just worse at night. Whereas most aches and pains get better at night. And if you find you've got a really deep bone pain that paracetamol briefing isn't touching, then you should see your GP. And they can then talk to you and say, is this something like arthritis or do we need to get an X-ray and refer you up? Yeah, yeah. And you may at times have to remind your GP yes. about your past diagnosis because whilst you remember every day, your GP may not have yeah. checked back in your notes. So, and if um, you remember, you... GPs Sorry. have to be experts at every single medical, pediatric, mm. gynecological, neurological, surgical illness. They can't mm. remember everything and they forget. And you often see a different person every time. So when you make your appointments, say, I have had breast cancer, I have bone pain, could this be met? So I'm worried. Yeah. Just say that, just back. to jog them. Yeah. And also, always go back to your treatment team again. Don't yeah. ever, I mean, if, if you knew, in doubt, call us at Breast Cancer Now to talk it through. You'll speak to a nurse on the other end of the line, 0808 800 6000, and we can talk you through what yeah. we feel would be your next brilliant. point of call um, if, you're, if you're worried about going to see somebody. And, and really the message is, as you've been saying, is go and report it. Don't yeah. wait. Yeah. And I will say the anxiety is real. I've probably had fake scares every year where I think, oh my God, I'm going to die. And mm. I almost, I need a CT scan of my body to stop my head going crazy. And most GPs are pretty good and understand the fear that we all feel. And it's almost actually, I cannot carry on living unless I know I don't have Mets. I know it's probably not, but could you get a scan? And most GPs are really good and will help. So don't feel bad about hassling people because you are going crazy at home with fear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Loads of people um, telling us that they're doing exercise. Um, I mean, an exercise is fantastic for getting your endorphins going, for feeling yeah. better, good mood, lifting. And, um, but there's another deep. benefit. Exercise has been proven to halve your risk of recurrence. Mm. Now, chemotherapy might decrease it by 5%. And the hormone tablets might decrease it by two or three percent with a very small tumor. But exercise, and that's aerobic, getting your heart rate up hot and sweaty three times a week and doing resistance training, so lunges and squats, can reduce your risk of your cancer coming back by 50 percent. It's a no brain. And I know it's hard. It's the last thing you want to do, but it really is the one drug we should all be taking. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to say it again, start slowly. Don't yes. go crazy. Don't think you've got to do this three times a no. week. Start with your brisk walking, build it up yeah. um, and uh, make it manageable because we've yes. all given up you know, with exercise because it's just not a manageable thing. You've got to do no. something you enjoy. But a brisk walk, listening to a podcast or an audio book, you know, and just do it for time, not distance, because some days you'll be knackered and barely move. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And don't be hard on yourself. No. Um... This is a good question. Morning or night for tamoxifen to reduce hot flushes? Ooh. Sure there's an answer to that one. But, um, Everybody is yeah. different. Mm. I used to take mine at night because I reckon by the time it was absorbed, it would be the morning and I was less likely to have night sweats. But everybody is different. And this is really important. And I used to think patients were making it up when they told me. Different brands of tamoxifen and anastrozole yeah. can change the symptom profile simply because of the other chemicals used to make yeah. that drug. So if you are struggling on the Novartis brand of tamoxifen, ask your pharmacist to order the Walida brand or a different brand. It sounds crazy, but it can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I get, think, I, sorry, Rachel. I know, I was just going to say, we get lots of calls about that and we do check out what the buffers are in the drugs. So again, if you want to know that and see what, the least amount of lactose or other yeah. things in it, then, you know, we're really happy to check that out for you. Carry on, Liz. Yeah, but I would say take it at night for a couple of weeks and see how you get on and then take it in the day for a couple of weeks and see if that makes a difference. Um, some people say it doesn't bother, some notice a massive difference, but 
it's it's up to you just mm. um there's a question about what can you do to help reduce hormonal hair loss ah mm. yes and as well as hormonal hair loss there's hormonal hair growth so i had to pluck my chin hairs out before i came on because they just appear overnight now i'm menopausal and those long hairs around the nipples that weren't there the day before hair loss is sadly one of the side effects of the menopause that every woman could experience when they stop producing estrogen mm. and there is very little you can do about it sadly um, it just happens and stopping tamoxifen probably won't help because you're going to go through the menopause anyway yeah. it's really really hard and I know for a lot of us our hair is a huge thing especially if you've had chemo and it comes back yeah. and then you get the hair loss um, I have no idea about whether various shampoos and conditioners can make a difference I think eating a balanced healthy diet so you're getting all the vitamins and mineral minerals to help with the hair not being hard on your hair so not using hair straighteners and strong chemicals and heating products to be gentle with it um but sadly, it's just one of those things. And I wish there was something we could do about it. It's, my, um, it's just lack of estrogen, sadly. And yeah, one of my top tips is if you want to know anything about hair care is get in touch with Cancer Hair Care. Um, They're Jasmine brilliant, aren't they? is absolutely amazing. Yeah. She will do a one-to-one, one-on-one -one consultation with you. If any hair issues, whether you've lost hair, it's coming back, uh, all of those things after chemo. Um, yeah, and they have really the dolls, excellent. don't they? They do. do they? Yeah. So what Jasmine has is she's got knitted dolls of women of every skin colour um, and they've got hair. And then when you flip the skirt over, they're bold. So it's a really nice way of showing your kids what mummy might look like when she loses her hair. She's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Really recommend it. So that's cancer hair care. Um, oh, a couple of questions, actually. I haven't had any side effects. Is this normal? Yes. Is it working? <laughs> Some women sail, like the menopause, some women sail through without anything at all and others are suffering. So some women don't get any side effects. It is working. It's just your natural reaction to the menopause. But I've seen a couple of questions coming up asking about what they can do about hot flushes and what people have tried. Mm. So you shouldn't have HRT because it's giving you estrogen and progesterone. There are some doctors who will prescribe it because the menopause can make people suicidal and just feel horrific. And it's personal choice. I would never prescribe it as a breast surgeon. Now I'm a patient. I still don't think I would want to take that risk. But there are things you can do and your GP might not know about it. Mm -hmm. So probably on the breast cancer on our website and I cover them in my book, The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer. For hot flushes, there's a drug called clonidine that's normally given for heart problems, but actually in low doses can help. And two antidepressants, venlafaxine and citalopram, can really, really help with the hot flushes. So you can ask your GP to prescribe them if you're struggling. Um, and if you want to read about all of those things and supplements and everything else that goes with this, have a look at our menopause booklet on Breast Cancer yeah. Now's website. It's a really it's, comprehensive um, it's really good. guide. Yeah. And whilst we're talking about booklets and support, I know lots of people, I mean, and we did talk about this at the beginning about um, dry vagina, sex, yeah. intimacy, loss of libido. Again, yeah. we have a really good booklet called Your Body Intimacy and Sex. Yeah. And all of it will go into all about lubricants, moisturizers, how they work, what you can do, and also catch up with Liz's um, yeah. broadcasts in the past because um, really, really useful advice. So I think. A really important thing to say now is that it is proven to be safe to have vaginal estrogen if you have yeah. ER positive cancer. It is a tiny, tiny dose absorbed just through the vaginal skin and it makes a massive difference because estrogen is a lubricant. Just having it in your vagina makes it moist. It stops you getting recurrent cystitis. It can stop sex being less painful. But annoyingly, a lot of GPs and surgeons and gynecologists don't know it's safe to prescribe and don't want to. And I've got friends who've been sent around in circles, but you can have it. It's a yeah. small little pessary that you just pop inside your vagina like a tiny, tiny tampon, and it can make a massive difference. And I'm actually going to be releasing a podcast in the next couple of weeks called Don't Ignore the Elephant. And I talked to the amazing Samantha Evans from Sam Talk Sex. We've got a whole episode on sex and lubricant and masturbation and dilators just to help get your sex life back after the menopause. So yeah. keep an eye out for that. Yeah, because it's, it's often about experimenting for yourself to know how yeah. your body feels and responds now because it responds in such a different way yeah. potentially. Um, and knowing that for you before you are then 
with whoever you're with yeah um is, is really and it's how you it tell just them gives you more how confidence you... yeah. it does yeah. and you're not alone and again the leaflet is tips on how to talk to your partner to say things are going to be a bit different from now on but you can still have sex in a lot of different ways so don't give yeah. up yeah and sex is really important whatever it's almost age whatever it's age like it's a human right and I think doctors yeah. and nurses need to know to ask you about mm -hmm. it so you feel you can say and if they don't ask in an appointment you can say actually I'm not mm -hmm. having sex can you help because yeah. you can get lubricants like yes on prescription mm -hmm. um which which are fantastic there are so ask your doctor just be brave yeah and stand and up don't, for what you need you can tell how passionate we both are about this don't <laughs> give up at the no. first go with a lubricant or a moisturizer it might not work it might not be the right one for you try again and many of the companies will do samples free so yeah. it doesn't mean that you've got to buy them um some of them are but available I, as you said on but actually yeah. ideally you want one that doesn't have any chemicals or parabens the stuff that you buy yeah. over the counter in boots like durex is just awful the yes yeah. lubricant is fantastic and there's yeah. one called sutil which is a silicone based one and they're completely safe to put in your vagina and like a lot of things advertised on instagram at the moment so yeah Absolutely. And again, we've got a really comprehensive list, which we've researched um, in that booklet, Your Body, Intimacy yeah. and Sex. It's brilliant. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. I can't remember what it was. Um, question about how long you take hormone therapy for. OK, so if you've got um, a relatively small amount of disease so it's a you haven't needed chemotherapy and you don't have positive lymph nodes most people will take treatment for five years there are now trials that have shown that if you have a larger volume of disease basically meaning that you've either needed chemotherapy or you've had positive lymph nodes there are benefits of taking it for 10 years and if you were if you were meant to have it for five years before this evidence came out and you go for your five-year follow-up your doctor may recommend you having it for another five years Thank you for that. Um, anything else that you've seen popping up that I'm So might someone said it's five years the standard for tamoxifen. Um, so as I said, five years is the standard if you haven't needed chemo and don't have positive disease. What we used to do then was switch people onto an aromatase inhibitor, but sometimes we're now keeping you on tamoxifen for 10 years in total. But there are, you, breast cancer is one of the most heavily researched and evidence-based um, specialities and every time you're seen at follow-up your team will know the latest evidence and they will know whether they need to increase the dose you're on or not so it should happen automatically if you're struggling on tamoxifen and you're premenopausal um, you could a lot of women say is it worth what, switching on to an AI but actually that can make it worse because an AI removes um, all the estrogen and a lot of people have been asking about tamoxifen and Zolodex Yes. So if you're premenopausal, you can have, you can't, you can only have tamoxifen. Anastrozole only works if your ovaries have stopped. Now, sometimes we give Zolodex during chemo to switch your ovaries off to try and preserve your eggs. But let's say you've had chemo, you've had treatment. For most women, young women, tamoxifen is enough. For some women, again, with quite severe advanced amount of disease, Cutting their estrogen even more can add a tiny bit of benefit. And it happened to me because I had a big cancer. They said, we want you to have tamoxifen and we want you to have Zolodex injections for two years just to really drop the levels. And God, I struggled. Firstly, mm. it's a bloody big needle. And I'm quite yes. slim and there was no fat to put it in. And having that every month and the nurse would look at me and say, God, it's her again. There's nothing. I hated it. And it was like a menopausal kick every three weeks. And then it would fade off. And I thought, I just, I had six months and I said, I've had enough do I really need it? And my oncologist said, well, actually, the data shows it's maybe only adding another one or two percent benefit. And I thought, really? Yeah. I'd rather not have it and just have a bit mm. of a better quality of life. Mm. Um, but if you've got quite bad disease, they may recommend you have that. The alternative is to have your ovaries removed, which is done as a day case surgery with keyhole surgery. And that will put you into an instant surgical menopause. So it's like a double hit of Solidex, but it's one hit. Yes. And then it wears off. And I had a local regional recurrence, so I had to swap from tamoxifen because it came back on that. And I ended up having anastrozole and Zolodex. And after two months, I said, no, I want my ovaries out because I didn't want the injections. Mm. But if you're concerned about what you should be having, again, ask your breast care nurse to talk to your oncologist or your surgeon and they can explain what's right for you. Yeah. So someone said, what happens after 10 years? So mm. all these drugs have side effects. 
And we have to weigh up the balance of reducing the risk of the breast cancer coming back compared to the long-term collateral damage. The tamoxifen is a great drug at doing what it's meant to, but it can cause endometrial cancer. So any woman over the menopause who has postmenopausal bleeding needs to go and get it checked out. It doesn't happen very often, but it can. It can also cause cataracts and strokes, and it can cause clots in the legs and the lungs. And it's just because it makes the blood a bit sticky. So anyone who's had a history of clotting or bleeding problems won't be allowed to take tamoxifen. Um, and we know it's, if you've had bad disease, it's worth giving it you for 10 years, but any longer than that, you're more likely to get bad side effects. And with the aromatase inhibitors, because you have no estrogen, the risk on your bone health has been shown it's not worth to have it more than that time. But these drugs have a long half-life. If you take tamoxifen for five years, you'll actually get an effect for about another seven to eight years after that. So there is a, you do get some effect, but we don't carry on after five or 10 years because we will do you more harm than good. Sorry. So no, it's fine. Go ahead, Rachel. No, it's just, um, somebody has asked um, about your recurrence, as in you, Liz, yeah. um, while you were on tamoxifen. So I'm, typical doctors are always really complicated. I had, <laughs> I, I, I had a, I thought I had a cyst and it was a two and a half centimeter lump not seen on mammogram, seen on ultrasound, and the biopsy showed it was a mixture of ductal cancer, which is the commonest, and lobular, which can be really sneaky to find, especially in dense breasts like mine. And that's because lobular grows in sheets of cells that are hard to see, whereas a ductal cancer forms a lump you can see on a mammogram. Because it was lobular and it's sneaky, I had an MRI and that showed it was actually six and a half centimeters. And I hadn't felt it, and I'm a breast surgeon with expert hands. Mm. they gave me chemo first because I was young and to try and shrink it down so I could avoid a mastectomy and after chemo um, my MRI showed it had completely disappeared but I still had a mastectomy because I've got my boobs are tiny and there were 13 centimeters of lobular cancer left in my breast the ductal had melted away but lobular doesn't really respond to chemo it's more hormone sensitive and I had three positive nodes so I had a load of radiotherapy and I was on tamoxifen and two and a half years later, I'd had a nodule on my chest wall just below the mastectomy scar. And I just thought it was scar tissue. I've been having physio on it twice a month for two years. And I got a lot of pain with my implant and I decided to go flat because I couldn't take it anymore. And my surgeon said, let's just get that nodule checked out. And on one view on the scan, it looked normal. But on the other view, it was a three centimeter recurrence. And I didn't know what it was. Again, I'm a breast surgeon. So I had surgery, I had to switch to um, letrozole and I had my, um, I had more dose of radiotherapy. It's just bad luck. None of these treatments are 100% effective and we know it can come back in up to a third of women. Yeah. But yeah. that doesn't mean you have a one in three chance of it coming back. Mm. It's, um, it's all about quality of life and I guess having a discussion with your GP, yeah. talking to breast cancer yeah. now, finding out how can I cope with these problems mm -hmm. and how much am I prepared to put up with? And I know I thought about throwing tamoxifen in a bin and my husband said, I don't know whether I could cope if you stop because I want you to be around. And it's really hard when they're not the one going through it, but it's just mm -hmm. that, what is my life worth and yeah. what am I prepared to accept? Yeah, absolutely. It's all, it's often just, it's a, that balance, isn't it? Yeah between the effects and side effects and having, if you can, having that a relationship with your team yeah. so that you can say to them, look, I can't do this. I need something. Yeah. Is there something different? Um, and I've had treatment breaks. I've had a month off because I just needed it. Mm. Um, and yeah. it made a huge difference. I've got a special event coming up. I've got a really busy time in my life. Can I just stop for a month? Yeah, fine, go back on. And that was some women just have a treatment break every year just to keep them going. Yeah. And particularly with hormone therapy, when you're trying to work out what's going on, is it, is it arthritis that's happening? Exactly. Is yeah. it the drugs that are doing this to you? Having that break is, is important because yeah. you, you can then work out with your team what the heck is going on. Um, I am on trastuzumab and pertuzumab, but have yeah. only had alongside chemo. What are the side effects likely to be when taken without chemo? Not much. So Herceptin drugs have to be given with chemo because that's what all the research papers were 
designed for, although we're now giving them less and less, but you'll often carry on once chemo is stopped. They're very few. You may feel a bit headachey and a bit fluey for the first 24 hours and then it'll settle down completely. Chemo is the one that has the massive effect. So you might have a, just an off day, the day of the injection, and then that should be it. Weight gain. Someone's yes. asked about that. It's an absolute bugger. Pardon my French. Mm. It's the menopause. A lot of women, when their estrogen stops, their metabolism slows down and they start getting fat around their tummy. And it's really, really, really hard to shift. And every surgeon and oncologist will say, it's not the tamoxifen. It's got nothing to do with the drugs. And we go, yes, they are. It's the menopause. It happens yeah. to everybody. The best thing you can, and sadly, the fatter you are, the higher your risk of recurrence, because the more fat you have, the more estrogen you make. So there's more estrogen for the drugs to act against. And it's like a double-edged sword. Um, you can lose the weight. And here's the thing, so I'm, I'm slim, but I put on six kilos and that's 10% of my body weight. And everyone says, no, there's nothing there, you're fine. But actually that's huge, that's a dress size for me. And it took me a year to shift it, but that was exercising in the gym and cycling and eating a healthy diet with a lot of protein. And it was blooming hard work and it can be done, but it's not easy. None of this mm. is fair. No. Regarding diet to really help, it's, it's having a lot of protein. I used to live, most of us, cereal, bagels, toast, can't be bothered to cook, no protein, maybe a bit at night. I have a protein shake with my breakfast because I don't like eggs or cheese or bacon. And I'll often have another protein shake in the afternoon and ideally 20 or 30 grams at every meal. And I don't have a lot of carbs at night because the carbs you eat at night will often go to fat. Yeah. Um, and that has helped me. But it's hard. It is yeah. really hard. Particularly when you're dealing with all of the other, the onslaught yeah. of all the treatment and the treatment that you're currently on, it is really, really difficult. It's not and fair. It's, and it, yeah, and it's again, not something that is trivial. It's really, really important to how you yeah. feel about you and yourself. So um, someone's asked about Zolodex and chemo and period. So the closer you are to the menopause, the more likely chemo is to make you infertile and stop your ovaries working. The younger you are in your 20s and 30s, it may not. It may put your ovaries to sleep, but they may wake up again. Some people have periods through chemo because it's not switching them off. And that doesn't mean it's not working. Chemo affects all the growing cells in the body. Zolodex will switch them off to some point, but you may still have periods you don't need to worry. Just a look, I think coming to the end. So how can men don't have these issues? Well, they do actually. Men do get some hot flushes. Men have a little bit of estrogen and they do get the side effects. Um, just not as badly as us because they don't have as much estrogen as we do. And some people do take a low dose of tamoxifen. I know a couple of people have gone from 20 grams to 10 and then 10 to 5. The difficulty as a doctor prescribing that is the trials aren't based on those tiny yeah. low doses. So we don't know how effective they are. They may not be helping at all. Mm -hmm. And we would rather you had the full dose and then have a month or two break than take a tiny dose that might not be doing anything. Mm -hmm. but, and that's a discussion you have to have and be really honest with your doctor and say, well, it's my life, it's my choice, this is what I want to do. Yeah. As long as you're prepared to accept that if it did come back, you won't blame yourself for having a lower dose. I and that's hard yeah, too. It is very hard. But again, I think that what comes out of all of the discussions we've had tonight is keep talking to your yeah. team and then they will know what you're dealing yeah. with. And if they're not listening to you, then find somebody who does. That might yeah. be your GP, it might be your breast care nurse, it might be your oncologist, but it's just finding that person. So I've seen two questions I want to ask. One about mastectomy okay. and recurrence, the one about pregnancy. So... Someone said, I've just had a mastectomy, but I can feel a swelling below the scar. It's five weeks post-op. So that is likely to be one of the internal stitches just dissolving away. You can often feel them as little hard lumps underneath the scar, little bits of fat necrosis. Recurrences in the tissue will often take six months to 10 years to come back. Mm. Some people have quite an aggressive cancer. And, and if it's going to come back in the skin, quickly it's lots of little red dots like a rash a bit like shingles that will go over that strip of the breast and that can be painful that needs to be seen quickly but I've only seen one in my 20 years of being a doctor recurrences come back over months to years and they're like little lumps and nodules but immediately post-op don't worry it's all just change pregnancy 
Um, breast cancer is really rare in women under the age of 40. It's less than 4% of all breast cancers, most in women over the age of 75, and most recurrences and deaths are in women in their 80s and 90s. Being pregnant doesn't cause breast cancer, but it does make it harder to detect because your breasts are changing, they're getting bigger. And that's why it's important just to keep checking them regularly. And a lot of young women seem to get inflammatory breast cancer. We don't know why. And that's red rash on the breast that can mimic mastitis. And a lot of GPs don't realize this could be cancer. So if you do have a rash on the breast and it hasn't settled down after a couple of weeks of antibiotics, you need to tell your GP to send you to the breast clinic because it may not have crossed their mind. It is safe to get pregnant after having breast cancer and it doesn't increase the risk of your cancer coming back. It is safe. We generally recommend you take tamoxifen for two years and then stop because tamoxifen can deform a fetus. So you have to use contraception on tamoxifen. But if you want to get pregnant afterwards, you can stop it after two years. The one thing that gets picked up about pregnancy is that it causes really bad cancers and it doesn't. It's just that they're picked up late because they can be harder to find. So more women need chemo during pregnancy because they didn't realize they had cancer. And the other side of that is that it's generally younger women who are pregnant, yeah. who, who are, do not commonly have breast cancer. Yeah. Um, so someone's asked about the signs of recurrence. Now, I don't know whether I ever told my patients what the signs of recurrence were because I didn't know when to. Yeah. When do you say, you know, it's post-op, all the margins are clear, off you go. By the way, did you know it can come back? Or see what a year. It's really, really hard. But breast cancer can come back anywhere from six months to 20 years down the line. And breast cancer now have got an excellent information leaflet about the signs of recurrence. Um, and it's generally um, in the lungs where you have a bad cough, you feel short of breath. It's in the bones where you have a really bad pain deep at night. It can come back in the brain and that's more common for the HER2 based cancers. And that could be dizziness, your vision's gone, you're a bit wobbly on your feet. And if you have any of those things and they've been there for a couple of weeks and you can't explain them and they're not getting better, see your GP and tell them you've had breast cancer. But again, the breast cancer now nurses, you can ask them, do I need to be worried about this? And you've got a great infographic on the, the website, haven't you? We have, we have, yeah. And I think probably just one final question. I yeah. have a blood clotting disorder, so can't take tamoxifen. What are the alternatives? Okay, so if you are pre-menopausal, you're still having periods, then you have to have Zolodex with an aromatase inhibitor, so an astrazole or letrozole. And if you're after the menopause, then you can just take an astrazole or letrozole. Thank you, Liz. As always, absolutely brilliant session. And thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, amazing things, Liz, that you've been posting over the last few weeks and months. Um, really, really helpful stuff. Uh, we will be back again with lots more broadcasts over the course of the next month. And take care of yourselves. Remember, we're here 0808 800 6000 if you want to give us a call tomorrow. And um, yeah, you can watch us again on uh, Facebook, which we will move this over to there after this broadcast. And if you have questions there, we can hopefully answer those too. Take care, everybody, and I will see you soon. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Thank you.